Let's take a quick look at social network analysis with R. I actually started creating a lab with detailed steps, uh, but then I realized that we really have not covered enough of R for you to be able to do this. Nevertheless, I wanted to give you a flavor of what kind of things are possible with social network analysis in R. Now, if you're interested, uh, please do contact me and I can work one-on-one -on -one with you to uh, essentially go over the details of how to do the things that I'm talking about here. Okay, so we are familiar with the popular social network sites like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, today what we'll do is I'll take an example of a social networking site called meetup.com. Uh, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this that uh, it's essentially facilitates the creation of people with like uh, interests, meeting up to do whatever. Like for example, you can have a yoga group, hiking group, you know, people who like to program in a certain language, they can have a, a group, anything. People can meet up for anything whatsoever, right? And it's, it's a social network. You've got groups, you've got people, people uh, are meeting up in groups. Just like Facebook is a social network in which you've got people and they have friends and each of those people have friends and so on and so forth or LinkedIn. It's all the same thing, right? So given social networks like this, what kind of things can we do with social networks, right? Uh, some of the uses of analyzing social network uh, data would be, first of all, to try and understand what is the structure of this network, right? You could ask questions like, on the average, how many connections does each node have? By node, I mean an individual or whatever it is that makes up the network. On the average, how many do we have? What is the standard deviation of the number of connections that a node has? Okay, on the average, what is the distance between two nodes? By distance between two nodes, you mean how many other nodes do I have to go through to get to a particular node? Right, you can ask questions like this. You can also ask general questions like, you know, is the network such that each node has roughly the same number of connections to other nodes? Or do you have nodes, a few nodes, which have lots of connections and most of the other nodes have very few connections? Right? So you ask questions like this. And why would you ask such a question? Well, let's say you're looking at it from a marketing perspective. You want to spread an idea. right? Then if you look at a social network, you want to analyze its structure and you find there are, that there are two or three or four or a certain small number of central elements that have connections to lots of other elements, then obviously it might be a good idea for you to try and spread your message to these central elements, to devote a lot more effort to reaching these central elements as opposed to just spreading the same effort for everybody. Okay, So you've got all of these kinds of analyses that you can do with analyzing social networks. Okay, so let's try and see what you can do with social network. So what I did was I took up the data from uh, the site meetup.com. So meetup.com essentially has a bunch of groups and each group has several people who are members of a group. Okay, so that's really what we have. You can do, of course, lots, all kinds of analyses with this kind of a structure. What I wanted to do was just to do an analysis of the social networking structure of a group. In other words, if two people belong to the same group, then I say that there is a connection between them. In other words, they, you know, they may meet at various occasions in group meetings and so on, so they are connected to each other. On the other hand, if you have two people who have no common group memberships at all, then the two are not connected. Right? So from a social network point of view, if two people have a common group membership, then you can say that those two nodes are connected by a line in terms of a social network, right? So then you have the network and you can do all the kinds of analyses that I spoke about earlier, right? So this kind of logic would apply to any kind of social network like, uh, you know, like uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or uh, anything, Yahoo groups or Google groups or Google Plus, any of these things. Okay, so very broadly speaking, you can represent the group and user membership like this, right? So you've got groups, in this case, I've just shown four groups. 
and I've shown nine users. What this diagram says is that group one has members one, four, and seven. Users one, four, and seven are members of group one. Users one, three, four, six are members of group two, and so on. Right? So if there is a one, it indicates that that particular user is a member of that particular group. Okay. So now from this structure, you can construct another structure which looks like this. So in this case, we just have users and users. And uh, the number of groups that are common to a, to a pair of users is what is shown as the element. So for example, of course, user 1 is a member of three groups. So 1 and 1 are shown as having three groups in common, although it's the same person. right? Users 1 and 2 have only one group in common. Right? So if I go back to the previous slide, I can see that users uh, 1 and 2 have only one group in common, namely group number 3. Right? So this is the only group that is common to both users 1 and 2. Okay, Because otherwise you see 1 uh, is a member of group 1, but 2 is not a member. 1 is a member of group 2, 2 is not a member. Both 1 and 2 are members of group 3. Uh, uh, one is not a member of group 4, 2 is a member of group 4. Okay, So this is the kind of information that is shown here. So that information is summarized like this here. Okay. Now when you do social network analysis, how will you collect this information? Right. So essentially all of these sites like Meetup and Facebook and Google Plus and all these sites allow us to download some amount of data from their sites. Okay, they provide what is called as an applications programming interface or API. And in fact, pretty much through their website, you can download most of this information. Okay, typically you will have to acquire some kind of a key from the site, and then you use that key to perform all your downloads. Okay, that's the way it works. For each individual group, you can go to the website and find out how exactly to use their API. I have information on how to use the Meetup API. If you're interested, you can contact me and I can walk through the steps with you. Okay, so uh, from this, so R obviously R has uh, mechanisms to convert the downloaded information into R. So for example, when you download information from a social network site, you'll get it in the form of either an XML format or JSON format, right? So once you have that file, then R has packages by which you can take that information and load it into an R data frame. Now, this particular network is a small network. You've got, you know, nine users. That's all there is, Very unnaturally small, just for illustration. In general, if you take a site like meetup.com, it'll have hundreds of thousands of users, right? So when you construct a matrix like this with users and users, that matrix will be huge. And in fact, most of the elements will be zero, right? Most people, a typical group will have something like 50, 60, 70 members. But overall, the site will have hundreds of thousands of members. And most of the pairs of people will not have any group memberships in common. With the result that most of the elements of this kind of a network would actually be zero, because most people are not connected to each other, right? So let's say you have uh, 10,000 people, right? And you have a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. Now, probably 1% of the cells will actually have values and the rest of them would be just zeros, okay? So therefore, it's not usually a good idea that that kind of a matrix is called as a sparse matrix and it's inefficient to represent it act actually like this in the form of matrix. Most of the time, such matrices are represented in this form where we have a row only if those two concerned uh, users have any common memberships, right? So in this case, one and one have a common membership, one, one, three, two, one have a common membership, which is one group. Uh, but elements which are zeros will not even appear here, right? So if you have a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix and overall it has only, let's say, you know, 100,000 elements altogether, as opposed to 
all the possible combinations of 10,000 by 10,000, which is 10 raised to the power 8, right? And only 1,000th of that is actually occupied. Then representing like this makes a lot more sense, right? We indicate only those cells. We indicate the row and column number for any cell which has a non-zero value. So you can convert it like this, right? Using matrix multiplication and other operations that R provides, you can actually create this information. In fact, the way in which I did it for illustration purposes, not this data, but the other data with which I worked was, I first went over to the meetup site. I picked up a certain list of groups in which I said, well, show me groups of people who are interested in, uh, in hiking and who the groups which are located within a 25 mile radius of a particular zip code, right? I got the details of all those groups. By details, I mean I just got the group ID um, and uh, uh, the group name and the number of members in that group. Then after that, what I did was I used their API and went and got the IDs of the people who are members of each of these groups. Okay, so I got all their IDs from that. Okay, so then from that I was able to construct this matrix and from these matrix uh, I was able to construct this one using functions that are provided by R and then I finally constructed this one. Right, now this is called as an adjacency matrix because it shows you which two rows are adjacent to each other. Now, once you have this, you can then go on to visualize social networks. For example, not this network, but the data that I downloaded for hiking group interest, that network has a shape like this, right? So you see that you've got a bunch of people here who are all connected in the sense that they all have, each number represents a particular user. And you see that all of these users have some common membership. So for example, uh, user number 23 and 24 have some groups in common, users 23 and 18 have some groups in common, and so on and so on. 23 and 4 have some groups in common. So if there's a connection, a link between any two nodes, it means that those two users have at least one group in common. right? Now from this, you can take a look at this and find that, for example, user 16 is a kind of central user. 16 is connected to 21, 19, 15, 18, 4, lots of connections. It's a very central user. 23 also looks like a central user, right? Uh, so this is sort of a bunch of people who are not really connected to these other things, okay? So it's very clear that uh, not all the users have some common group memberships. So for example, one has, user one has no common membership with any of these other users and so on. So we get an idea of the structure of this group. Okay. Now incidentally, if you download real data from meetup.com, you will find that you've got uh, huge numbers of groups and you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of users. Okay. So when you plot a network of that kind, it'll become, it'll be a really crowded and busy network. So what I did just for illustration is to uh, cull out some of the data and I plotted only some of the data just to give you a feel for what it is. Okay. Now when it comes to plotting, we have lots of different options. Instead of choosing to plot it like this, we can instead arrange all the users in the form of a, a circle and then show the connections. Okay. Sometimes it's easier to see uh, which nodes are uh, very uh, active from that. So for example, in the earlier diagram, we saw that 23 uh, was a very busy, uh, busy node. Oh, where is user 23? 23 is here. And sure enough, yes, lots of outgoing nodes. But there are others also which are pretty busy. 10 looks like a very busy node. It's got lots of connections. Even one is not bad. It has four connections and so on. So you visualize the structure of this network. Okay. So this network, it just so happens that it, uh, it doesn't seem to have a few highly connected nodes and the rest are all sparsely connected because in reality this group here uh, is very very highly connected okay there are several nodes which have 
lots of connections. Okay, you have some other options in terms of plotting the network. You can say, well, instead of straight lines, I want curved lines. That is possible. You can choose the color of the of the nodes, right? You can you can change all of these things. Uh, you can also plot what are called as bipartite groups. So, for example, the very first diagram we saw, we had users and groups, right? But what we were interested in was just which users are connected to each other. But if you wanted to visually plot the membership of users with groups, you can plot a bipartite graph and that would look like something like this. But this data is just randomly generated. It's not the data that I have shown earlier. I'm just showing you here that you can visualize social networks in many ways using R. You can also compute certain network metrics. So for example, for every node, you can compute the degree of a node. The degree of a node is simply the number of other nodes to which a node is connected. And usually we'll be interested in the, you know, in a network, you'll have thousands and thousands of nodes in a real network. And you might not be interested in this degree of a specific node. Instead, you may want to, you may be interested in things like, what is the average degree of the node? What is the standard deviation of the degree of nodes? Okay. And then you can talk about things like centrality. That is, given a particular node, how central is the node? Okay, so you have two types of centrality called betweenness centrality and closeness centrality. And then, of course, given a node, you can find all its neighbors and so on. Okay, there are lots of other metrics that you can generate with respect to these kinds of social networks. Right now, sometimes let's say you have two different social networks and you want to compare them. Right, one way would be to compare them visually in terms of their structure. Another way would be to compute these network metrics and talk about how the network metrics for one social network compare with the network metrics of the other social network. Okay, so you can then talk about certain abstract characteristics of these social networks. Let's look at one other technique that is pretty common in uh, unstructured data and that is the technique of sentiment analysis. Once again, consider the situation for which we plotted word clouds earlier. Okay, so again, in this, looking at it in the same way, organizations gather a lot of textual data, right? For example, companies have all kinds of blog postings and Twitter and Facebook comments about them. Uh, or even if you look at our own Seton Hall scenario, we have a course evaluation system. And within the course evaluation system, every student uh, some many students type in unstructured uh, basic feedback. Okay, now if the uh, dean, for example, wanted to get an overall picture of how things are going with respect to teaching, or uh, the dean wanted to find out, you know, essentially what are the things that people are saying, how, what is the overall feeling, is it positive or negative, things like that. Okay, so one thing we could of course do is to create a word cloud as we had done earlier and get an idea of what are the key uh, concerns in the system. That's one thing we could do. But we also may want to find out what is the sentiment? Is it positive or is it negative? Okay. What is the sentiment expressed in all these words? Right. Once again, we've got thousands and thousands of textual responses and we want to find out how many of these are positive statements and how many of these are negative statements. Right, the sentiment expressed in each of them. Another scenario where you might apply something like sentiment analysis is, uh, let's say you've got a company and the company gets lots and lots of emails from customers, let's say, a customer service. Now we may want to find out of all the thousands of responses we are getting, which are the ones we need to address most importantly, right? So in terms of prioritizing, uh, messages that you get from customers right so you can analyze the sentiment and then try to isolate those which have seriously negative sentiments take a look at them and do something about it okay so it allows you to sort through and find out which in which uh, uh, communications are important and need to be addressed very quickly and which are sort of neutral and need not be addressed very immediately right so from the text we want to identify what sentiment it represents. 
okay r has some facilities for sentiment analysis but what i'm finding is that it's still not very robust and uh, requires a lot of program coding to create the sentiment analysis and we haven't covered enough r to actually look at the code behind it but it's very important for you to have an idea of how uh, of the fact at least that these things are possible right and once these things you understand are possible and you need to do it, you know or uh, you can find out how to do it. Okay, so in a very contextual manner, let's say uh, you want to analyze something about the elections. So what is possible is that we can use the API of Twitter to get tweets that have been made about the topic Donald Trump. Okay, so you could get, you could download a bunch of tweets uh, that have been made about uh, Donald Trump. And then, of course, we can try to do some analysis of that. I Meaning, how many of the tweets have expressed a positive sentiment, how, a sentiment, how many express a negative sentiment? Okay, of course, from those tweets, we can create a word cloud of what are all the words which are appearing. But uh, when you download data from Twitter, you also get the data about the location coordinates from where the tweet was made. So you get the latitude and longitude. So once you have that, you also know from where the tweet occurred. right? So using all of this information, you can do a lot of interesting analysis. I came across an article on the web which had analyzed uh, the tweets of Donald Trump. So I just want to share that with you to give you an idea of the kind of things you can do, right? So this person who did that analysis created a word cloud and clearly we can expect the kind of words that you expect to see here, Donald, Muslim, uh, support, okay, slave, etc., etc., debate, uh, things like that. Okay, of course, Ted, ban, Okay, so you see that these are all the words that play a big role in the tweets which are connected with Donald Trump. Okay, you can also analyze the tweets in terms of how many tweets were made on each day of the calendar year. So you can see that uh, there are spikes on certain days. Maybe this is a day when, uh, you know, uh, they had a meeting or it could have been a day when some uh, particularly interesting comment was made by Donald Trump and so on okay so you can do that sort of analysis as well now the most interesting part of this of course is uh, R has certain packages uh, that identify certain words uh, that associate words with sentiments right highly positive highly negative this uh, this word expresses joy that word expresses sorrow this word expresses disgust and so on Right, And then when you look at a communication and you look at all the words in the communication, you can find out the sentiment expressed by each word. Many of the words, of course, express no set of it. sentiment at all. So if you find out all of those uh, sentiments, you can then get an idea of what is the overall sentiment of a particular piece of communication. Right. So they did that for the Donald Trump uh, tweets and found that, of course, most of the Tweets are fairly neutral in terms of balanced, uh, but then you've got uh, these are all the positive sentiments and these are the negative sentiments. So it looks like it's pretty much balanced uh, with the positives probably slightly outweighing the negatives. Okay, so you could do that. And then, of course, you could, you know, this is not related to sentiment analysis, but you could talk about, uh, you know, uh, location wise where the tweets occurred. And uh, the size of the b b blob might represent uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, tweets, the number of times each of those tweets was retweeted, things like that. Okay, so you could do these kinds of analysis as well. Okay, so there are all of these kinds of possibilities for analyzing public data. And all of these, of course, are big data because if you look at Twitter and Facebook and so on, uh, or Meetup, uh, the number of uh, entities and the number of interactions are usually very, very large. You can also do things like this. How many tweets came from each zip code? How many 
uh, top 10 cities by the number of tweets. Uh, you can do all of these things. Okay, so that's another thing that you can do with big data. Okay, and again here, uh, by looking at it by state and looking at the sentiments, okay, and uh, here the color indicates the kind of sentiments, right? So the darker colors indicate positive sentiments and the lighter colors indicate negative sentiments. So from this, you're able to see uh, which are the places where there's a lot of positive sentiment and negative sentiment based on the tweets that were uh, tweet sent out by people on a particular topic. Okay, so again, these are all things we could do with the kind of data that is available, with the kind of software that's available. And once again, uh, I did not create labs for some of these things because we still haven't done enough R to be able to do this. Okay, another kind of application that is typically done with uh, data that you can gather from the web is word prediction. So for example, if you look at any of our smartphones these days, clearly when you're creating a text a message, for example, the moment you start typing certain words, uh, the phone predicts or suggests additional words that we might want to type. Okay, how does the, uh, how do they figure this out, right? Given when you're typing, how do they, what methods do they use to try and predict what our next word is going to be? Okay, one way these applications do that is they first of all create corpus, right? A corpus is nothing but a collection of textual information, right? So for example, one way in which they can get a corpus is uh, Google tends to use its uh, Google Books um, database, right? They have the full text of thousands and thousands of books. So they can put all of that together and create a corpus of the English language, right? Another way you can create a corpus is to go out and gather lots and lots of text from various blogs, put them all together and create a corpus of this language. Again, we could create a corpus from Twitter. Uh, we could create a corpus, let's say, from all the articles published in New York Times and so on, right? So what you could do is to take uh, English language corpus, which will typically be a huge amount of textual information, right? One gigabyte of textual information and so on, right? So once you have the corpus, what they do is they create what is called as an n-gram, okay? Which is nothing but n adjacent words. That's what an n-gram is. Here we can see three grams. So for example, uh, suppose the text that we saw said, a boy cried. Okay, so that's the first three words. So that's a three gram, a boy cried. Okay, and then maybe uh, the next, so you want to look at all the three adjacent words. The first three words are a boy cried. The second three words are boy cried that that sentence ended and here's the beginning of the next sentence he cried okay so the boy cried uh, then uh, it should not be he cried uh, it should be he did not sleep okay and so on okay i shouldn't have cried here uh, cried yeah that's the first ending of the second first sentence second sentence begins here he did and then he did not then did not sleep and so on, right? So essentially what you do is you take a corpus and depending upon what, how many consecutive words you want to consider, right? You create that kind of n-gram. If you're interested in considering four consecutive words, create a four gram. Three consecutive words, create a three gram, okay? And so on. So you create several n-grams and then simply use these n-grams to predict the next word. So for example, Let's say we've created this three gram, and of course you'll have lots and lots and lots of rows of this, right? If you have a one gigabyte of corpus, right? And you create, let's say three grams, you're going to have literally millions and millions of three grams, right? So the same two words, for example, a boy came cried, right? Then somewhere else, a boy ran, might have been there. Somewhere else, a boy, jumped might have been there right so you've got all of these different possibilities now next time when you're typing on your phone let's say you've already typed 
two words. Okay, and the two words you typed might have been, let's say, a boy. Now, the phone is now trying to predict our next word. What they can do is they can go into this uh, three grams and look at all the three grams in which the word a boy occurred as the first and the second word. Right? Then they can look at the frequency with which different words occur as the third word. Right? And then give the top two or three as choices for us. Okay? This is essentially how the word prediction goes in smartphones and uh, or in other co contexts. Okay? So that is also something that people do with, uh, with big data. They gather all this information and then uh, you know, use it for these kinds of applications. Right? So the goal of this session for me was to uh, just give you an overview of some of the non-techniques that are applied on textual information. After all, the bulk of information on the web is textual. And uh, so far, we have looked only at, uh, up to this class, we looked only at analyzing quantitative data. And analysis of textual data is a very important aspect of big data. Unfortunately, I was not able to show you actual code with which to do all of these things. But nevertheless, I wanted to leave you with a feeling for the fact that these kinds of things are possible.